The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the unsung heroes in the cancer ward. We got to make sure we don't spread negative messages. How these chaplains are bringing hope into hospitals and 16 years in the sex industry. I'm like, yeah, this is it. Now, see how she escaped. I couldn't stand to look myself in the mirror anymore. Plus, Dr. Kevin Lehman shares how to raise strong kids on today's 700 Club. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I want to talk to you about an anatomy of a smear. How does it work? How does it happen? Let's go through the list in relation to Brett Kavanaugh. First of all, you've got a man who's appointed to the law faculty of Harvard University by a lady who is now sitting on the Supreme Court. Secondly, he is on the second highest court in the land. His decisions are so right smack on that they're quoted numerous times by the Supreme Court as the reason to, for, for their decisions. He is uh, acclaimed by the American Bar Association. He's acclaimed by all who know him. He is simply an amazing human being. He's got a lovely wife. He's got a family. He's got all these nice things. Now, that's the way it was. Now, he's appointed to the key seat in the United States Supreme Court, and the left gears up its uh, attack machine. Now, what do they do? First of all, some of the senators begin calling him a, quote, monster. How did he get to be a monster? He's a monster because he's going to be there as a deciding vote to take away their power. So now he's a monster. Secondly, they begin to bring witnesses against him to say he's a sex fiend, he's a serial rapist, he's, he's done all these horrible things to women. Well, that doesn't work because the, the, the reports of these women doesn't uh, bear out. So what's the next line of attack? Well, he's a mean, staggering drunk. And, oh, people who knew him in, in, in college said, oh, you have no imagine. He threw a pitcher of beer at somebody. He's mean, nasty, uh, obviously unfit to be a judge. All of this is all not true. But nevertheless, the Senate is going to confirm him. They're not going to uh, pay attention to that. And the FBI, according to what I understand, should have all the work they're doing finished by Wednesday or sooner. Today, that's tomorrow. They, as a matter of fact, most of it is done already. They'll have a report in hand. And Mitch McConnell, God bless him, is standing, standing tough. And they expect to have a vote uh, by uh, Friday, maybe even sooner. So, but... Ladies and gentlemen, that's how the smear tactics work. Can you believe anybody would be torn up that way by the left? They don't care about character, character assassination. It doesn't matter. What they care about is power. What they care about is the destruction of the United States of America, the moral fabric of this nation. And the Supreme Court has been the focus of their uh, power grab and they've been able to manipulate, you know, let's face it, all you've got to do is get five judges, and if you can talk them into something, then you have a decision which can be uh, monumental in affecting the uh, moral fabric of this nation. And I went over with you before some of the Supreme Court decisions. I won't do it now. But that's been the focus, ladies and gentlemen, of the power of the left in this country. And they're getting ready to lose it. And that's why they're doing this thing to Kavanaugh. So don't pay any attention to all this garbage that's coming out about staggering drunk and, and all the other. I mean, but I'm telling you, to see these senators uh, repeating these lies and bringing these charges, it's just an outrage. But the quicker they can get a vote in the Senate, the sooner this will end, at least, at least for the time being. And they need to vote. So vote maybe Friday, could vote Thursday. As soon as they can get the FBI report, I think Jeff Flake will be on board. I hope Lisa Murkowski will be on board. I hope Susan Collins will be on board. And I dare say a couple of Democrats, maybe more than two, maybe even Chris Coons 
will come along and well, vote. That'd be nice. That would be very oh, nice. Yeah. Sorry. Well, I, the FBI is wrapping up its investigation, it seems, and Gary Lane brings us the latest on that. Delay, delay, delay. That's what Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says he expects more obstruction tactics from Democrats. But the Brett Kavanaugh Supreme Court confirmation vote will move forward. So soon, I expect we'll hear that the conclusions of the expert prosecutor who questioned both witnesses at last week's hearing aren't reliable, or that the FBI's investigation was not infinite or endless enough for their liking. And so let me make it very clear. The time for endless delay and obstruction has come to a close. The FBI has already conducted six background investigations of Kavanaugh, but it says it will complete a supplemental probe of sexual assault allegations. With sources telling CBN News it could end by Wednesday or Thursday. Christine Blasey Ford alleges that Kavanaugh groped her and attempted to rip off her clothes at a drunken high school party 36 years ago. Rachel Mitchell, the sex crimes prosecutor, who asked questions on behalf of Republican senators Friday, gave them her report on Ford's story, including this statement. Dr. Ford has named three people other than Judge Kavanaugh who attended the party. All three named witnesses have submitted statements to the committee denying any memory of the party whatsoever. Last Friday, the deciding vote to send Kavanaugh's confirmation to the full Senate came from Arizona Senator Jeff Flake. He had a caveat, a one-week FBI investigation of the sexual assault allegations against Kavanaugh. The condition came after this encounter in a Senate elevator. Look at me when I'm talking to you. You're telling me that my assault doesn't matter. The two women confronting Flake are left-wing activists with the Center for Popular Democracy, according to John Fund of National Review. He reports it's a group that opposes Kavanaugh and is reportedly heavily funded by billionaire George Soros's Open Society Foundation. Flake now may be siding with some Democrats and demanding a more extensive FBI investigation. Senator Dick Durbin says Mitch McConnell is in a hurry to go a vote, but he says he'll wait and see what the FBI uncovers. If the FBI produces an investigative file and we get a chance to read it by the end of the week, uh, I think they will have satisfied their mandate. And if the FBI delivers by Thursday, a confirmation vote from the full Senate may come as early as Friday. Gary Lane, CBN News. Well, the one thing they haven't brought out yet is that uh, yearbook from Holton Arms. And I have not read it. I don't know what's there, but everybody kind of whispers like, well, we can't say what's in it. And they, they took most of the copies off the, the table. But isn't that interesting? Those two activists who screamed in Jeff Flake's <laughs> eye were paid for by George Soros. He has not been a friend of democracy. You go back in history about who he is and what he is and what he's done. It's pretty shocking stuff. But he's made an awful lot of money, and he's using it to undermine the values that we hold dear in this nation. George Soros paid for the organization that sponsored those radical women. They weren't just a couple of people off the street. I think it's time we do an investigation of that accuser. You know, really, somebody needs to get into her background. Because the senators have all given her a pass. Or oh, aren't you a wonderful woman? Isn't it marvelous you're bringing all this stuff out? Well, what if it's all a lie? What if it didn't happen? What, what, what if it... You know, the thing about it was she said she, she can't fly, and then she starts using the term BWI. Now, I've flown an awful lot, ladies and gentlemen. And I, I'm a pilot. I can fly my own. I've been able. I can't do it now, but I used to be able to fly my own plane. I know about those signals, but calling the Baltimore airport BWI is something only a seasoned traveler would do. And she calls it BWI, and then says, well, I'm scared to fly. I, don't, I can't fly. Nonsense. Okay. Well, while Washington is consumed by the Kavanaugh case, a long, uh, uh, well, uh, threat to America is quietly getting bigger and bigger, our national debt. And this is something, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have our news department do a study about what it will mean if the interest rates go up one quarter of a percent, what will it be if they go up a half of a percent? What will it be if they go up one percent? Twenty-one and a half 
trillion dollars. It's gone up an entire trillion dollars in the last year. And our spending is out of control. And I'm Democrat and Republican, none of them seem to be talking about the danger of this, of this debt. John Jessup has it. Pat, the federal debt, as you were saying, shot up again in fiscal 2018, growing by nearly $1.3 trillion, bringing the total national debt to just over $21.5 trillion. CNS News reports it's the eighth time in the last 11 fiscal years that the debt has grown by at least a trillion dollars. The Congressional Budget Office projected in June that the national debt will reach nearly $100 trillion by 2048. Well, the Ottoman Turks tried to overrun Europe centuries ago, but they were turned back at the gates of Vienna. Today, Turkey is again establishing a presence in Europe, recently dedicating one of the largest mosques on the continent, this time in Cologne, Germany. Dale Hurd has a story. The new Cologne Mega Mosque is an important addition to Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's network of European mosques. And it's part of what some warn is a dangerous and growing fifth column inside Europe. But when Erdogan arrived in Germany to christen the new mosque, what began as a welcome with military honors went downhill quickly. The lavish televised ribbon cutting was marred by protest. This German protester said, when I heard that Erdogan will receive a state reception, I was appalled. He slaughtered Kurds, invaded Syria, and imprisoned hundreds of thousands without court orders. Erdogan got a cold reception from Germany's president. German leaders had already backed out of attending the mosque opening. And at Erdogan's press conference, a journalist protesting over jailed reporters in Turkey was forcibly removed. While Germany allowed the giant mosque, the Austrian government has shut down Turkish mosques and expelled 60 imams in June because they were being funded by the Turkish government and because these photos from inside a mosque showed Turkish children being trained to be martyrs. The leading expert on Turkey's network of mosques and Islamic associations in Europe, Abdallah Bozkurt, calls them Erdogan's fifth column. What we have been uh, seeing in the last couple of years, an increased uh, activity on the part of the Turkish government to turn the mosques uh, that, was, that were financed by the Turkish communities or by the Turkish government, or imams deployed directly from Turkey to serve as sort of political operatives. Bozkurt warns that mosques like this are the basis for a proxy force that can strike inside Europe. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thanks, Dale. Iran's Revolutionary Guard says it launched ballistic missiles into eastern Syria against ISIS forces. ISIS blames the terror group for a recent attack on a military parade. This was Iran's second ballistic missile on Syria in over a year. One of the missiles shown on state television carried the slogans, Death to America, Death to Israel, Death to Saud. Some Iranian missiles can travel far enough to strike targets in Israel. And for more on the story, let's go back to Pat. Well, CBN News Middle East correspondent Chris Mitchell is here with us now from Jerusalem. Chris, good to see you. Great to be with you, Pat. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, what's the deal about this Iranian threat with these missiles? Are, are they really accurate? Very accurate, Pat. In, in long range, they have uh, their Sahab 3 is about 1,200 miles. They have a cruise missile that can go 1,500 miles, and, uh, and they are accurate. As Benjamin Netanyahu said on the other day, sometimes they can be within 10 meters of a target, so it represents a, a serious threat. You know, it's not only Iran, but also in Lebanon, and he released information intelligence uh, just the other day that there are uh, factories inside Beirut itself, and I think we have uh, uh, footage of that, where actually they are taking conventional missiles, transforming transforming them into precision guided missiles. And, uh, you know, you and I were up on the uh, second, uh, in yes. Le second Lebanon War in 2006. At the time, they had 14,000 missiles. Now they have 150,000 missiles. Come on, Chris. Yeah. 150,000 missiles? Exactly. And, and that represents, obviously, a severe threat. Many of them can hit anywhere in Israel. What is Israel going to do with that kind of a threat? I mean, should there be a preemptive strike? Uh, I don't, they have talked about it over the years. They've said if they're not going to fight that war like they did the last war, they're going to go in. They, uh, some people have said, Israeli generals have said that they're going to make, uh, you know, bomb Lebanon back into the Stone Age. 
because of the threat that it poses. But the other threat, uh, uh, Pat, is certainly the Iranian nuclear deal. I talked to uh, Uzi Rubin, who's Israel's top expert, yeah. uh, missile expert. He said it was gross negligence for the Obama administration to leave ballistic missiles out of the Iranian nuclear deal because they represent such a such a powerful weapon. And and back uh, earlier this year, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu released intelligence captured by the Mossad inside Tehran, where in 2005 Iran was was developing technology to miniaturize. Uh, a nuclear device, put it on a ballistic missile, and that represents a threat not only to Israel, but to the United States as well. Was the Obama administration obtuse or deliberately uh, trying to cover up this uh, Iranian th threat? Well, he, uh, Uzi Rubin was telling me, especially on the, uh, the ballistic missiles, they knew that if they, uh, they tried to include missiles into the deal, they wouldn't have a deal. So they were willing to take a bad deal rather than no deal at all, and that's what he was telling me. And so this is, uh, you know, something that, that really is uh, is for Israel, Israeli leaders. When you talk to them, Pat, they say Israel has three main enemies: mm -hmm. Iran, Iran, and Iran. Well, uh, the Iranian people are kind of friendly. They're friendly to America. Well, what is? Who are uh, uh, these mullahs? I mean, how serious are they? They they really are fanatic. Uh, they, they are fanatics, and, and, and right now there seems to be this, this hint, this glimmer of hope that could be regime change. Uh, the Trump administration, I think, is taking a, a page out of the playbook of the Reagan administration. You know, he said the Soviet Union was running against the tide of history because it denies freedom. Yeah. And so is Iran. Rudy Giuliani said just a few days ago that it's just a question of when uh, there'll be a regime change. And uh, I think that's the thing that many people are, are hoping for. The Trump administration also is taking a page by p placing maximum economic pressure on Iran, just like Reagan did against the former Soviet Union. You know, I got to know the uh, former Israeli ambassador to uh, Iran, and he said the college students and the workers uh, have within their authority to overturn those mullahs. So do you think this... Uh, are we going to help anybody, uh, you think, uh, or is, is Israel have, having somebody to assist the forces of overthrow? I, I think Israel is doing that. I also think the United States is doing that. I think that's exactly what they're doing. And, and Pat, I met some Iranians, uh, Iranian believers coming out of Iran, and they just despise the kind of oppression and lack of freedom that they have inside Iran. So I think there's, there's a wellspring of, of hope mm -hmm. that the, finally the regime could be overthrown. It's been almost 40 years since the Mullah has taken over in 1979, and now 40 years later, perhaps there'll be a regime change. Right now, it's an ex, uh, existential uh, threat against Israel. Israel is fated with that, that many missiles. I mean, they can blow that country to pieces if they try. If they try, exactly, yeah. So that's why, that's why Benjamin Netanyahu keeps saying they will not allow Iran to get a nuclear yeah. weapons because that does represent that. Well, you know, when we were over there, the, 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 the missiles couldn't hit anything. I mean, they kept shooting them, but they, fortunately, they didn't have good guidance systems. Now they've got... Exactly. As I was saying, Uzi Rubin was telling me 150,000 rockets. Most of them are Katusha rockets. Yeah. The same ones that I saw hit a hillside right That's behind right. you right. when you were making a, uh, a live yeah. shot with Fox right. News. Uh, but now they have about 1,000 to 2,000 rockets that can go 10 meters within any target. So, so when you th think of civilian population centers, military targets, when you can hit within 30 feet oh. of a target, that makes a big difference. Chris, keep it up, buddy. God bless you, and thank you for the work you're doing. Thanks, and you know, we've got to cover that, and not only cover it, but really pray for those who love Israel. Exactly. Amen. Well, Pat, congratulations on 57 years. It's been wonderful. And <laughs> over in Jerusalem, we're proud to be part of the CBN family well, and excited to be part of the new CBN News Channel. Isn't that exciting? It's Tremendous. Very exciting. Well, God bless you, man. Terry, what's next? Coming up, how to talk to someone dealing with cancer. Listen, I'm with you, and we're going to get through this together, and uh, whatever you need, I'm here for you. That's very different than saying, I'm so sorry for you. Chaplains share what to say to cancer patients and what not to say when we come back.
cancer, cancer survivors. I am a survivor of prostate cancer. My wife is a survivor of breast cancer. We've both survived it and lived well beyond it. But an estimated 40% of adults will be diagnosed with some form of cancer during their lifetime. The physical and emotional trials take a tremendous toll, and spiritual life can also suffer as well. Laurie Johnson went out to, enter, to meet some people who are dedicated to helping people who are dealing with this cancer and what they can do spiritually. All hospital chaplains have a demanding job, but imagine if every patient in the hospital had been diagnosed with cancer. All That's a reality for Lawanda Long, who tries to meet this deep spiritual need. The pain and the sickness and the suffering that you go through can weaken your faith sometimes. As chaplain of Atlanta's Cancer Treatment Centers of America, she walks from room to room, prepared to deal with almost anything. If they're angry at God and they, they lash out at me, I take that because I know it's, it's not me personally, but I mean, when, when, to make us grow closer to God, sometimes we have to vent. We have to say, I'm upset, I'm angry. That's what David did in some of his lament psalms. Her mission? Help patients know the peace of Christ and his presence in the storm. God will walk you through and will we'll be with you in uh, good times and in bad times. And the, God, uh, the, the, the Lord doesn't promise that bad things won't happen, um, but that he will always be present. Yes. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cry, but um, I've, I, 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 I've never felt God's presence anymore. Chaplain Long helps people who know God grow closer to him. For others, she makes the introduction. When she said, God loves me, Nobody had ever told me that. For me to hear that and replay that in my mind over and over and over and over and over again, then I felt like regardless of what happened to me, I was going to be okay. Years ago, a patient told the chaplain she received better spiritual care here than at her home church, which made the chaplain realize churches need to learn how to minister specifically to cancer patients. So Cancer Treatment Centers of America began Our Journey of Hope. Church leaders attend a two-day seminar learning how to specifically minister to cancer patients. The great thing about this training is it is totally free for churches. And, and then they go back and train others to become cancer care ministers. Among the lessons, when talking to a cancer patient, don't discount their grief. I hear a lot of patients tell me, that they don't like when people tell them, oh, it's just hair. A lot of times when people begin to lose body parts, whether it's hair or whether it's their bladder or whether it's their breast or a kidney, they do grieve that. So I think we have to make sure we hear their hearts. Avoid telling people how to feel or think. Because when people are told that, they feel uh, minimized as if they don't matter. Have compassion, not sympathy. But you say, listen, I'm with you, and we're going to get through this together, and uh, whatever you need, I'm here for you. That's very different than saying, I'm so sorry for you. Don't cast doubt on their treatment plan. Sometimes I meet people who have great faith, but they begin to lose hope. And don't tell a cancer patient about someone who died of the disease particularly people of faith, we got to make sure we don't spread negative messages. So while medical professionals do what they can to treat physical needs, others help these cancer patients focus on God as they walk through it. Bless every doctor and nurse you assigned to care for Mr. Hasty. Give them wisdom and knowledge, Father God, anoint them with your grace. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Well, if you'd like to know how to start a cancer ministry at your church, go to our website, cbnnews.com. Uh, it's so, so important. And it's important to know people are praying. It's important to know that you're being supported. But you know, God has placed inside of every one of us a tremendous uh, defense against cancer or against any type of uh, infection. And we have an immune system which, if activated properly, 
uh, has a way of resisting the cancer cells that are trying to take over our body. But the people have got to have hope. They've got to have prayer. They've got to believe God. And uh, I think that is the most important thing of all. And so if you've got somebody in your church that can help, or you want to have a, a cancer uh, ministry again, we'll, we'll be glad to give you the information to, so you can start something like this in your church. And what a blessing that would be. Terry, what do you got next? Well, still ahead, the right way to raise kids when times are tough. Dr. Kevin Lehman joins us to share how to help your children through the dark days. So stay tuned. Well, let's face it. The world our kids are facing is vastly different from the one we grew up in. Bullies are no longer just in schools, they're on social media. The news is filled with stories of violence in the classrooms. So how can parents help their children navigate these troubled waters? Dr. Kevin Lehman has the answer. New York Times bestselling author and psychologist, Dr. Kevin Lehman, believes that our children are living in one of the most challenging times in history. With reports of school shootings, racial violence, cyberbullying, and terrorism, our children are looking to us for answers. In his book, When Your Kid is Hurting, Dr. Lehman helps parents guide their kids through tough times, making them even stronger. Well, Dr. Kevin Lehman is here with us now, and we welcome you back to the 700 Club. What a wonderful book. I really enjoyed reading this. Thank you. That's a, a needed book. It's the only book I've ever said publicly a parent must read. Yeah, it, it really is true. Every parent, I think, wants to be able to converse freely with their children, but sometimes, even when kids are very young, if it's something that's deep and a wound, or they're not old enough to know how to express it, then teenagers shut down sometimes. How do you get your child to talk to you about things? Well, number one tip is don't ask questions. <laughs> I mean, parents love to ask questions, and you women, I mean, you love questions. <laughs> and here's the it's irony. It's our specialty. <laughs> yeah, I know. But here's the irony. Husbands and kids share commonalities. Husbands hate questions. So do kids. Husbands hate the Y word. So do kids. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to a kid when he comes home from school? How was your day today, honey? Fine. What'd you do in school today? Nothing. Don't do that. <laughs> but if a kid says something... You can say, you could say, tell me more about that. Now, tell me more about that's a command, but it doesn't put up the defenses. Yeah. So, so if being you, good listeners. If you can it? listen without judgment, mm -hmm. we'll a kid see. comes through the door, you know it's a bad day. You can just make a statement like, wow, I can tell it's been a rough day. Hey, this may not be the time or place, but if you want to talk, I'm available. And that teenager especially might come into your bedroom at 1030 at night, sit on your bed, and won't shut up. I love the way you broke things down to out there issues and in their issues. Talk a little bit about that. Well, kids see things. They see volcanoes in Hawaii. They see hurricanes. They see devastation, uh, tsunamis. Uh, and a four, five, six-year-old kid, I'm not sure they should be looking at screens to begin with in general. But they see it, so you have to deal with it. And they're, they're afraid. And sometimes you have to just, I call it rearranging their State of the Union address. <laughs> where you might say, honey, that happened so far away. We'd have to get in the car. Yeah. We'd have to drive four days, spend four nights in hotels. But be proactive. Uh, the Red Cross will accept your donation. Operation Blessing. I was talking up a storm yesterday to a guy on an airplane about what they do Good with the 700 you. Club through Operation Blessing. Yeah. And write that check and let the kids see that you care about other people. Yeah. But the outdoor, the out there experiences. You have to be able to tell a kid, hey, we're here. Grandma lives down the street. Your little goldfish, Gill, is doing fine, swimming along great. So you reframe it for the child, Terry. What about the in there things? Well, best friends forever. you got three little girls. They're 11 years old. They hold hands. You've seen them. Yep. <laughs> They're three little peas in a pod. And all of a sudden, your 11-year-old is on the outside looking in. Yeah. And she doesn't want to go to school. What do you say? I know what I'd say. I'd say, honey... I'd feel just like you. That's got to hurt to be turned on like that by your best friends. But you are going to school tomorrow. But let me give you some advice, and you can accept this, reject it, modify it. 
and I'm 30 years older than you are. I'm like farmer's insurance. I know a few things because I've seen a few things. Uh, I want you to go in the cafeteria tomorrow and look for that student that's by themselves. I want you to sit across from them, introduce yourself, and you'll probably have to carry the conversation because chances are that kid's sort of shy. But at the end of the day, I want you to come. We'll have a little talk about how you felt about what you did with that kid who was by himself. Mm -hmm. So in other words, what I'm preaching, so to speak, is, hey, you have to teach your kids to run toward the fear. Do not yeah. develop the victim mentality. Mm -hmm. And parents today want to snowplow zero to life for kids. I just did an op-ed for Fox News in New York, and they tell me the readership on it was just sky high about not, they call it, somebody called it a lawnmower parent, like a helicopter parent. <laughs> and I said, every kid has got to learn that they need to shovel some snow, yeah. even if they live in Florida or Southern California. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no easy way, you, yeah. your kid needs psychological muscles. The only way they're going to get that is by them facing those problems. So yes, right. you have your back, your kid's back. You can even stand next to them. I don't care. You just can't be in front of them. Yeah. Talk a little bit about some of the fears our kids face. Well, the kid goes out to school today. Most kids are fearing that today's the day I'm going to be picked on. Yeah. I'm going to be singled out. So they fear rejection, the uncertainty of the day. My little granddaughter came to me and she said, Grampy, Grampy, I have 18 likes on Facebook. Isn't that good? I said, Adeline, tell you the truth. It's not that good. Do you really want everybody to like you? And she thought about it. She's 13 years old. I said, you know what? If that's your goal in life, to everybody like you, you're going to live a miserable life. Wow. It's more important that you learn about who you are, what you stand up for. And this kid, I mean, she's done it. I've watched my, she's, yeah. she's marvelous 13 year old kid, but they need a little coaching sometimes to be who they are. Well, and sometimes Kevin, with the in their things, you know, kids face the death of a parent or a grandparent, divorce, abandonment by one parent or the other. You say in the book that grief can, can actually be a positive or have a positive impact. All things that are living are going to die. Yeah. From the little goldfish to your puppy dog to you name it. Mm -hmm. And it's important to share tears with kids and yeah. realize we grieve differently. But anybody who's experienced grief knows grief comes like the wave off the ocean, hits you at the most inappropriate times. So if you're grieving and you just lost your dad or your sister or whatever, and the kids see you, your tendency is to shut down and don't let the kids see what's going on. The better is to let the kids see it, hold each other, and talk about the special moments you had with that person. What are some of the things you just mentioned, one of them, but some of the other things we do wrong in dealing with our kids and life? Well, that goes back to why I think everybody should read this book. We tell kids, oh, it'll be okay. Yeah. Really? How do you know it's going to be okay? And your 15-year-old saying, hey, you're not the one they're calling pizza face at yeah. school. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So saying to a kid, and again, the suicide rate among teenagers up 170% in the last couple wow. of years. So you just have to listen without judgment. Yeah. And that's the difficult part because most of us as men want to fix things. And most women want to go right in there and you're such great wordsmiths. Mm -hmm. You want to talk and talk and talk rather than just sit back and listen. Yeah. Well, you are a great wordsmith, <laughs> I want to say. Read the book, loved it, very insightful. And I, I want to just echo what you said. Every parent needs to read this. It's great advice. It's Kevin's latest book, When Your Kid is Hurting. And really, you need to know every child's going to be hurt somewhere, some way, somehow. So arm yourself, parents. Thank you for being with us. Always great to have you here. My sound, pleasure. sound advice. Well, coming up, the life and times of a high-end call girl. Penthouse suites, limousines, $5,000 bottles of champagne. I had clients that if I told you their names, you would know who they were. I loved it. One former porn star looks back at her years in the sex trade and tells us why she left the life. That's later on today's show. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News break. The death toll is rising in Indonesia. The country's disaster agency says more than 1,200 people have died following Friday's devastating tsunami. That comes on the heels of a major 7.5 magnitude earthquake. 
Officials say at least 34 of those killed were children who were attending a Christian Bible camp. Rescue workers said a mudslide caused by the earthquake engulfed the church. Officials say at least 800 others have been injured. Well, Azusa Pacific University has decided not to change the wording of its undergraduate code of conduct about LGBTQ relationships on campus. Last week, the Christian University's administration reportedly changed its policy, which had banned public LGBTQ relationships on campus. But the board said it never approved the change and that the original wording has been reinstated. The board statement contains five points, beginning with we remain unequivocally biblical and orthodox in our evangelical Christian identity. The Bible serves as our anchor. Well, you can always get the latest at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of today's 700 Club right after this. Kanda Marie was a stripper and a porn star. And her list of clients, including a who's who of the rich and famous, Kanda had easy access to all the money she wanted, and along with the money came the drugs. And yet, she couldn't even look herself in the mirror. Here's her story. When I was younger, I felt like I was blamed for a lot of things. Anytime there was an issue within the home or anytime somebody would say something, I would just think, well, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm not that smart. Maybe I'm not that good. Kanda grew up believing the world was against her, even God. I felt like he was always mad at me, like he was always disappointed with me. I was always having to constantly go and repent. Please forgive me, please forgive me. And when she was molested by a family member at 12 years old, Kanda blamed herself. Did I provoke that? What did I do? What was it about me that made that happen? I did not believe that I was worth love, but I wanted it so bad. And I wanted somebody just to put their arms around me and hold on to me and not let me go. But that didn't happen. It's very hard. It's very lonely. And it feels like something that you'll never attain something that you'll never have. Desperate, she married her first love at 18, but it was hardly the fairy tale of her dreams. Prince Charming wasn't so charming. It became violent, abuse and beatings and times that I had to call the police. I was so broken. In my mind, I loved him, and that's what love was. Then, Kanda took a friend's advice and became a stripper. Her first night on stage, she was nervous, but not for long. They wanted me. Can you imagine not just one person, but multiple people at one time? I'm like, yeah, this is it. They like me. <laughs> I kind of left that little girl thinking and feelings and hearts behind and just went full force into this. Kanda went from stripping to full nude bars and eventually porn. By the time she was 30, she was addicted to cocaine and traveling the world as a porn star and high-end escort. I was living in Vegas, in Sin City. Penthouse suites, limousines, $5,000 bottles of champagne. I had clients that if I told you their names, you would know who they were. They're athletes, they're actors, they're CEOs. I loved it. Candace starred in over 80 porn films. At her peak, she married for a third time. He loved her, but he loved porn more. He was addicted to porn in the life that I was living. I was like his dream girl. After 16 years in the industry, Kanda realized she still didn't have what she wanted. I was at the top of everything, and I had everything I thought I wanted, but it wasn't real. It just got to a point where I couldn't stand to look myself in the mirror anymore. I didn't like what I was becoming. It was as if everything I was doing just stopped filling the void. Felt like I was trapped, like I was hopeless. I was almost like I was feeling like I was again when I was a child. I got down on my hands and knees before my husband and I said, please, just wanting him to take me away from all this. He refused, 
But something inside Kanda wouldn't let her give up hope. I felt like on the inside, like there was something more. It was almost like I heard a voice on the inside saying, I've got something more for you. But I didn't know what that was. Kanda left the industry and her husband when she discovered she was pregnant. Strung out with nowhere to go, she reached out to her two sisters who drove to Vegas to pick her up. By the time they arrived, Kanda had miscarried. God, why? That I was finally gonna have somebody to love me. And I was devastated. Kanda flushed the last of her drugs and returned to Minnesota with her sisters. Still desperate, she accepted her sister's invitation to church. There was nothing left but God. I was so disappointed in myself. How could he be any more disappointed in me? I sat down and I heard the songs. They talked about a God that I really didn't know. They talked about him like he was right there in the room. And it was at that moment, she suddenly remembered the voice she'd heard months earlier. I've got something more for you. I went back to that. Really, could there be something more? I had to take a chance. I said, I want to know you. I want to be different. If you say that there's something more for me, I want to know what that is. Show me. That day, she finally realized that Jesus was the love she had always wanted. I had levels of I was so bad or I had done this so much and I didn't realize that he didn't have levels. He just forgave me and he has filled that void for me. He's the only one that has filled that void for me. Kanda, now happily married and a mother of four, shares her story with anyone in search of unconditional love. There's nothing there so wrong. There's nothing that's so dark, so dirty. He does love you. He wants to have a personal relationship with you, and he wants to love you completely and totally. There's something more. There's something more. Kanda, it looked like she had everything going for her. She was a very successful porn star, had all the money she could think about, had luxurious surroundings, but there was an emptiness. You see, there's no limit to what our hearts want. They want infinity. God, God has put eternity in our hearts. Why? So that we might seek after Him. And there's nothing you can do to satisfy all that. There's no amount of fame, there's no amount of material wealth, there's no amount of position, there's no amount of acclaim, nothing. Because God's put eternity in your heart. Would you look at somebody like Canada, look at what she'd done. I mean, could God receive her? I mean, she's a porn star. She's acted in all these films showing illicit sex and all that goes along with it. She's a call girl. She's taking money for sex. She's doing all kinds of things that are wrong. Could God forgive her? I mean, it looks like he would turn her down. But instead of that, he said, I've got something more for you. God doesn't reject somebody because they're a sinner. God does not reject somebody because of the activity of their lives. With God, there's always hope. There's always forgiveness, always a new start. And in Candace's life, God came into her heart. She met Jesus, and her life was turned around, and she found the love she'd been looking for all her life. And suddenly, God said to her daughter, come home. I love you. And he put his arms around her and welcomed her into the household of God. You could have that. You don't have to feel rejected. You don't have to hate yourself when you look in the mirror. God will forgive whatever you've done, and He will give you a new life. I'll ask you right now, if you want that, I want you to pray with me. And don't think you're too far gone. You're not. 
You're not. Just listen to me, and as I speak these words, you pray them with me. Will you do that? As I pray, you pray, and I ask you just to meet them in your heart. Pray these words, Lord Jesus. That's right. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, you know the life that I have lived. You know how I have broken your commandments. You know I've done things that are wrong that I'm ashamed of. But, Lord, I know that you have something more for me. And I come to you as a sinner. And I say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I receive you, Jesus. I believe that you died for my sins and that you rose that I might have eternal life. And so right now, Lord Jesus, I take you as Savior. I take you as Lord. And from this moment on, I will live for you, and I will serve you. Thank you, Jesus, that you've heard my prayer, and thank you that you've come into my heart. Now, if you prayed with me, I, I want you to do something. I want you to call and tell somebody what you've done. Now, we have on the telephones these wonderful counselors. Every one of them has made the same decision you had. They'll rejoice with you, even as the angels are rejoicing right now in heaven. And I want to give you something called uh, a new day that will help you uh, in the days ahead to live for the Lord. So please call right now. It's a toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000. 1-800-700-7000. So you pray. Say, I prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord. And if you don't even want to give your name, you call anyhow. But if you give us your name, we'll send you this material free. So call right now with the good news that you have become a member of the kingdom of God. Terry. Still ahead, another round of your questions, honest answers. One viewer says, I'm addicted to porn. Will God let me into heaven? Pat weighs in on that and more, so don't go away. Well, it's time for your questions and some honest answers. And Pat, this first one comes from Sue, who says, Dear Pat, I consider myself an independent voter, but as I was watching the Judge Kavanaugh hearings, I was in total disbelief when the Democrats were continually confronted with how they sat on the letter from Dr. Ford for over a month. The matter could be settled by now if it would have been investigated then. Not one Democrat would answer. Are there no legal ramifications for withholding this information? Are there no Democrats who thought this was wrong? I think I think this is really disturbing. Well, I think you should be disturbed. It, it was a setup, and Lindsey Graham uh, echoed the anger that was felt by so many. The, there's, there's no legal way. These guys are senators, these men and women, and uh, the only way to change things is to vote them out of office. Yeah. And that's, that's why this election that's coming up is so very, very, very important. Uh, we do not wish to see the control of the House of Representatives changed because then there will be endless, endless committees going after the president. In the next two or three years, our country will be in total chaos. So that's, that's the deal. All right. Here's a viewer who says, Dear Pat, you said a time or two that I can recall from my memory that we get appetites for food and even sex for procreation because of the way that God has created us. I get that, but I thought I had overcome pornography. But as a dog, I purposefully returned to my vomit many times and forgot my first love, Jesus Christ. My life is a total mess. I claim to be a Christian, but this is the one sin that distorts my life and mind. I'm always alone and I have no wife. I see and understand that even people in the Bible had lust issues, but I feel that this is about me and God. I'm very young, mere 20s. Honestly, I don't know if God will let me into heaven because the Bible says that the sexually immoral have no inheritance in the kingdom of God and the adulterers will be judged. Will he let me in? I'm fearful and tired. Remember the Bible says, I write unto you, young men, because you are strong and you've overcome the evil one. There, there is a tremendous amount of, of testosterone running around in the lives of young men. And the Bible says it's better to marry than to burn with lust. But you're not married, and you have these lustful thoughts. 
And look, the porn uh, industry is set up to cater to that lust and to destroy you. So what are you going to do? I suggest, if possible, that you find a Christian wife who would love you and you'd love. That would be one answer. The other answer is you've got to stop. I mean, you have to stop whatever you're doing. Any addiction, it takes 21 days to have a habit and 21 days to stop it. And that means no porn today. That means no porn tomorrow. That means no porn the next day. And it means you have to make, you are a free moral agent. You can't say, I mean, uh, the devil made me do it. I know you've got lustful thoughts and the porn industry has seduced you. But you need to cut the cord. And it means all that stuff that comes into your house, don't do it anymore. It's just that simple. And uh, I know that's hard, but it'll take you 21 days. Just count the days and you'll be free. We leave you with our power minute. It comes from Romans. If God is for us, who can be against us? Thank you for being with us today. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.